All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back continuing this mini series on the Minotaur archetype. And this is section three now of part four. I know this is getting a little crazy. And I, I knew it would just be a long video if I tried to do this all in one. So I'm trying to break it up so that it's easy for you guys to find the pieces that you want. It's digestible and it's easier to upload for YouTube. So where I left you guys off is I told you, okay, here's here's the stage that the hero or that the hero will encounter the Minotaur. Um, here's what will happen leading up to the Minotaur. The hero is going to receive an impossible task from the divine figure, aka the goddess figure, and they're going to have to go and defeat the Minotaur archetype in order to in order to retrieve the boon. Um, and so from that point what happens this is something I neglected to say in the last one from that point once the hero has left the divine figure and goes into that section he's now fully into what I would call the second section of the second half of the initiation act which is the transformation phase okay the, the first phase was the initiation phase second phase is the transformation phase there are four parts to this uh, four phases. There's the goddess, then there is the 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 battle with the the monster, which is essentially, or you might call it the approach to the innermost cave. People call it several different things, but this is where they're going to battle their innermost demons. Then you have the atonement with father. Oh, I'm sorry. Then you have the achievement of the boon and then atonement with father so those four stages those are the transformation stages where the hero will go from still relying on their psychological flaw to transitioning into using the psychological truth or their psychological center to get past that and reach their full potential so the reason why this is so important is because now the hero is going to confront the monster the Minotaur, which represents societal sins, which represents, um, it's reflective of the hero's own flaws and man's grotesqueness and all these things. And so when he faces it, he realizes that, hey, I cannot do what I've been doing in these last, through the road of trials, where I keep relying on my psychological flaw. I have to do something different. And so... This is another key thing on how do you defeat the Minotaur? Well, brute strength should not be the way that your hero defeats the Minotaur. Because if it is, it's kind of cheap, cheesy writing with no good fulfillment, okay? Um, the Minotaur or the, the, the Minotaur archetype, whatever character you have fulfilling this role, is... Power, too powerful in that sense and too too animalistic too primal the hero is going to have to come up with some tr some different way some trick some hack that hopefully is based on the psychological truth that will help them reach their fullest potential if you pardon me if you do that it's going to one allow the hero to defeat the minotaur using an unconventional means which will be you know narratively speaking that's fun exciting engaging and surprising for the audience and two it's going to show growth in their character arc and show that they're starting to transform in the transformation stage so um so i'll give you a, a really good example of this in the in the movie we referenced in the last section, which was um, Clash of the Titans, Perseus has to face the Gorgon, Medusa. And in order to defeat her, because she kills a, a bunch of people during this fight, in order to defeat her, he has to use a mirror and put it up to her face in order for her, she basically defeats herself. Um, or, no, I take that back. In some renditions, she defeats herself. In other renditions, um, this allows him to see her from a reflection and then kill her. 
So, it, you know, it depends on what version you're looking at. Uh, I was using Clash of the Titans. I honestly don't remember. I think he just used it. But the, the purpose of that, right? There's a symbolic meaning. That is very important. That's why this story has lasted for so long. It's because it's deeply ingrained in our subconscious. He uses a mirror. Because the Gorgon, just like the Minotaur, is a mirror, uh, a reflection of the grotesqueness of man and all of our flaws. And so the better that you set this character up, um, the and the way that they defeat the character, the archetype, um, the more powerful that moment will be psychologically. And um, so, you know, taking that into account, I think in Clash of the Titans, this isn't, to me, this is still kind of lazy writing, but it's it, it's it's more interesting than, than just having a brawl. Um, Perseus fights the Minotaur, and then he's able to break off one of its horns, and then he uses the horn to kill the Minotaur. Um, so, used the Minotaur's horn to kill the Minotaur. That That's, that's not the greatest writing ever, but it's pretty cool. Um, compared to like just having a sword and defeating the Minotaur in, in regular combat. Um, are there ways that there could have been more advanced writing? For sure. Uh, we're not going to go in that right now because there are other examples I'd like to give you. In The Hobbit, the, um, in The Hobbit, Bilbo is so used to hiding and, and the same thing with Thorin in a sense. Um, because the way they end up defeating Smaug is they have to band together as a team and face the creature head on rather than sneak around and steal. And so ultimately that's that's how they that's how they um, what's the word I'm looking for? That's how they thrust out Smaug from the Lonely Mountain. And then if you consider the, the next film, which is still part of the same story, then Bard ends up killing the dragon. This is kind of, that's more of an atonement with the father's face. So we're not going to go into that. But it really, if you look at it, it's really when Bilbo and Thorin Oakenshield band the dwarves together and face the dragon in order to, um, you know, get him out of the Lonely Mountain. That is them overcoming their flaw which was like running and not working together and and just facing their facing the monster head on so there's that same thing if you look at lord of the rings you know gandalf tries all the different ways not to go through the mines of moria to face the balrog ultimately they go through there they come against the goblins and then ultimately the balrog which is another representation of it's a demonic archetype but very very similar to the minotaur archetype that we've that we've been discussing and um gandalf basically has to sacrifice himself and and face the creature head on so the team can leave and then we find out later that gandalf actually smotes the balrog which is pretty cool scene um there there are other scenes oh, well you i think we said this perseus um uses the mirror to kill um the gorgon medusa theseus goes into the labyrinth uses a string so he doesn't get lost fights the, again to me this this is kind of lazy writing but he snuck in a sword, so he uses the sword to fight the Minotaur and kill it. But um, this is where you can get creative because it's up to you how you want the fight to go. I think the more creative, the better. <coughs> um, to me, when whenever a character uses an unconventional method to defeat a supreme foe, that is always like a... From, from what I've seen, an extremely cool 
way to get the audience's attention and for them to, because it, it goes against all the tropes that they've seen before. Um, and it, if you do it right, it will really bring home the fact that the hero is using their psychological center and is learning and transforming. In, in uh, The Matrix, Neo does this when he faces um, one of the agents for the first time. Rather than running, he faces them head on and he's actually able to, to hold up in a fight, which nobody has ever really been able to do that. So that, that was pretty cool. And um, again, before we finish this episode up, I just want to remind everybody that this character is not the final battle. This is the crisis moment, meaning crisis actually comes from this root word that means to cut. And um, it also is considered the crucible moment. So this, this is a moment pretty much in the middle of the story that is cutting the first section of the story off from the latter section of the story. And so even though this is probably the second highest moment of conflict in the story next to the climactic battle, it is not the climactic battle. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, now some follow-up things. What does the hero do once they've de defeated the Minotaur archetype? This is very important and um, very symbolic of of, how can I put this, um, what we would do in real life if this was really going on. And I don't mean like, uh, I mean psychologically, not physically do it in real life. So l let's say you defeat the Minotaur. Well, in many mythologies, when you defeat a monster, the next thing that you do is you use their power or their body or some artifact of theirs in order to go on to the next part of the mission. You either turn it into a boon, well, there's a couple of different ways it'll go. Um, you defeat the monster, then you have access to the boon. Maybe, maybe for example, in Lord of the Rings, I mean, sorry, in The Hobbit, Smaug is, is in the Lonely Mountain, and not only does he have all the treasure that he's guarding, but the Arkenstone is in there. So once they defeat Smaug, they have access to the Arkenstone, which is the boon of the story. It's like this ultimate symbol of power in that world. And um, and so that, that's an example of how you could have access to the boon. On the flip side, you might use the creature's body or artifacts from their armor in order to turn it into a boon. Uh, a classic example in a story that we've been discussing would be uh, when Medusa's head is then used as the ultimate weapon against the Kraken to defeat it. So they uh, they used its the the monster's body part as a weapon. In although I can't think of a story that like off the top of my head that everybody would know where uh, a minotaur was used for that. I can think of like a couple things off the top of my head. Like, for example, um, you could take the minotaur's horns and then use that as a weapon or turn it into a weapon. You could take the horns and grind them up into some sort of potion that then um, gives the hero strength and power, or the ability to fight vampires, I don't know. Um, things of that nature. That could be the boon. Uh, another thing that's very common in mythology is that they'll eat the creature or they'll drink its blood. And I know that sounds crazy, but the point is, um, psychologically, it's symbolizing that you and the creature are one and that you have obtained its power. So there's a transformation process that's going on here. Um, and, and actually I think in, there's this dragon slayer story from a long, long time ago where a dragon slayer that I believe their name is Siegfried, they like, they kill the dragon and then they bathe in its blood and everywhere that the blood touches on the, on the person's body then becomes invincible except 
he misses this one part, I think on the back of his neck or something. And so that then becomes his vulnerable spot. And um, this, is very, this is also very reflective of um, something else that the Minotaur archetype and, and in a larger sense, the dragon monster archetype represents, which is a vulnerability, the flaw. And so, for example, um, after they defeat Smaug in Lord of the Rings, I'm in The Hobbit, we start to see that Thorin Oakenshield um, becomes infected by dragon's disease, which is essentially this insatiable lust for power, for gold, for the Arkenstone. He cares. He doesn't care about anybody else. And he's starting to demonstrate all of those flaws that Smaug was representative of. And Smaug even tells Bilbo that he wishes that he could see it take over Thorin because he knows it's going to corrupt him. And the in the example I gave previously where Siegfried missed a point on his body and then there then there's now this vulnerability it shows that even though you obtain the power of the monster you're still human there's still a vulnerable spot Achilles is another good example of this where you have this ultimate warrior but they've got this one vulnerable spot and it speaks to the fact that nobody can be uh, you know no human no hero can be without vulnerability even after defeating uh, a crazy monster like that so the the point is once the hero has defeated the minotaur then it they have access to the the boon and they have they they will probably use the minotaur they will probably loot its body its carcass for usable materials and then you get to decide as as the storyteller how that works and what best fits for your story and what is best symbolically for your story. So hopefully that helps. Now we're finally done with section four of this series and we can move on to section five uh, right after this. Okay, take it easy, ladies and gentlemen.